just a couple of things. The other morning when I was looking at this again, either I hadn't slept well or I had too much to drink the night before or something, but I laughed ferociously at artificial intelligence and political science because I was thinking artificial intelligence and politicians, and then I was thinking artificial, they need to get some intel. Anyway, uh, so, uh, but of course the what me worry from Alfred E. Newman, uh, should we be concerned, should I be concerned as a professor of political science or the Bivens professor of political science with artificial intelligence, you know, doing papers for students and stuff. Uh, I, while we were listening, I, I got this great idea. I, my wife and I are working on some research looking at constitutional amendments in the state of Texas that failed. And I'm gonna have to ask chat GBT for, GPT, anyway. Uh, one of those things uh, for references on that because I cannot find any. No one ever looks at the constitutional amendments that fail. They only look at the ones that pass because they're part of the Constitution now, if they pass. Uh, and we actually have two, we have uh, looked at one that was rejected in 2011 and uh, passed in 2021. That's actually our poster for tomorrow's poster thingy over in the library, to use the scientific term, thingy. <clears throat> okay, not wishing to compete with Dr. Anwar, I've been here since 1998, uh, which I figured out the other day was about 25 years. It seems like a quarter of a century, but, uh, <laughs> Sorry, uh, I was all at the same time. I was thinking, boy, am I glad I graduated from graduate school, finished my dissertation in 1995, bef really before the growth of the internet, because I would still be sitting there in, in some computer terminal in Oklahoma looking up stuff, uh, <laughs> because I am very easily distracted when I try to do research, uh, obviously. So, uh, what I took a look at was uh, I started teaching. My first teaching position was in West Virginia in 1994. And while there, I typically taught uh, some core classes. Uh, it may or may not surprise you, but around the country, American national government tends to be, if not required, sort of highly recommended uh, for core. Some states have uh, other, like I taught a lot of criminal justice majors, even though I was political science. And so we had uh, state and local government was required for them, as was public administration and those types of things. So um, I usually taught core curriculum and then uh, this is, my model was sort of the general, uh, not so much as when I went to school, I still had a lot of professors uh, in the late 80s that would do the midterm final paper model. Uh, I also had some, <laughs> some instructors, I was talking to my dad about this, because uh, he was familiar with this. I don't know, you may not have instructors anymore. You know when the exam's gonna be. But I had some instructors, we'd be going along and next Wednesday will be the exam. It's like, whoa. I shouldn't have slept through the first seven classes. I <laughs> probably should have attended those. But uh, so that's the type of model that, that I sort of adopted when I first started. Then I started teaching online in 2000. Since 2000, I had my, uh, actually spring break of 1999, I remember what I was doing. I was being trained on how to teach online for all of spring break, all five glorious days trapped in the HLC. Uh, I think I got 500 bucks for it though, so that's 100 bucks a day. Uh, when I do political consulting stuff, believe me, I get more than 100 bucks a day, which maybe is why I don't do it very much. Uh, so teach at least one online class. So since 2000, I have taught an online class every semester, most summers, except for the fall of 2020, 2020. I didn't, I was on faculty development leave. Uh, most places call it a sabbatical, but here we have to call it faculty development leave because we can't use the word, oh boy, we're being recorded. Uh, uh, we can't use the word sabbatical. Anyway, uh, so what I decided to do, one of the things we learned there was you can't do that model of, you know, test, test, paper, because you have to try to uh, do different things. So what I, what I pretty much have adopted is uh, Political Science 2306, uh, American State and Local Government, has unit assignments and quizzes, their discussions each, each week, uh, and then I have no idea why I typed two examples in there, so I'll just uh, mention that later. Uh, really, uh, I guess my two examples would be, uh, the papers I usually use in that class are local government meeting project. And that's one of the things I'm learning about the shortcomings of a lot of the, the chat bots is that they're limited by, they're usually cut off, their information they've collected is cut off at a certain time. So the local government meetings, they have to go from the first day of class, which this semester was January 17th. So if they just happen to go to a meeting on January 16th, it doesn't count. Uh, but you know, are they gonna be able to get uh, ChatGBT to tell them all about 
what happened at the uh, uh, Randall County Commissioner's Court meeting of January 13th or whatever, or you know February 10th or whatever day they met. So I'm lucky that way because in political science, I do a lot of really up-to-date type of stuff. And so it, it may not be up, all that up-to-date. Uh, I did have uh, one semester I tried, or a couple semesters, I tried having two papers. That was an <laughs> utter failure. Uh, one of the things I learned in my training, by the way, for online was my classes would never be any larger than 35 the whole week. You know, uh, I try to think of her first name was Mackenzie. Mackenzie, uh, how big are my classes? Oh, they'll be no larger than 35. The first semester I taught, I had 90. Uh, and I still had three other sections. So she lied. I wanted to get more money out of her, but she wouldn't give it to me. She also left. Uh, I think I caused that. I tend to do that with other faculty members. Uh, so some more with my teaching online. I teach a stats class, data analysis. It's better to call it data analysis. It's much more friendly than stats. Uh, data analysis sounds like you're analyzing data, uh, which is a good thing. There we have unit quizzes. Sometimes they're a little obscure, some of the questions, but it's really hard coming up with how many multiple choice questions can you come up with on R square? Uh, it's not that easy. So they're pretty uh, uh, obscure in some cases. I also have three take home exams, which by the way, when I taught this class face to face, I would also have three take home exams. There's nothing I hate worse than sitting there watching students take an exam. Uh, I much rather take large needles and shove them deeply into my eyes than sit there and watch students take an exam. Have I mentioned I don't like watching students taking? Uh, but there is a semester project. Again, I mean, if, if they can get a chat GDP to do their statistical analysis, I, I would be overjoyed because they make the papers a whole lot easier to read. Uh, I did this and this and this and this, and I'm sitting there going, and yet you still got the mean on ordinal level data, which is impossible. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, and then some of the other classes I teach, whoops. Uh, I always stress in my syllabus that I want students to do real political science. And you're supposed to be thinking right now, is that an oxymoron, real political science? Uh, no, it's not. The real political science. So they interview people, or they go observe something, or uh, they collect data on something, uh, typically uh, census data and things. So that includes my other classes. For example, religion and politics, I actually have students go to a religious organization as a state-funded institution. I always feel uncomfortable saying church. Uh, it's always funny, though, when they go to St. Anne's and they walk in and sit down and they see me sitting up there next to the priest. That's, that's the highlight on my Sunday, usually. It's like, ooh, that's one of my students. I can tell because his eyes are this big. But uh, why is he up there? Uh, I sometimes ask myself that same question. But, uh, but I still have unit discussions. I'm a big discussion person. I get a lot more discussion in, uh, in an online class largely because I'm not there. Uh, as I tell all my friends and relatives, a Roush uh, hates a vacuum. You know, if someone's not talking, I'm going to be talking uh, because I cannot sit quietly and listen to other people talk unless I'm talking too. Uh, those of you who've been in meetings with me recognize that, <laughs> that even while they're talking, I'm back over here. So, uh, so we take a look at that. Uh, one of the papers I have them do in religion and politics is very interesting, and I, I might actually have to test it, uh, test the chat po bots on this. I asked the students to do a paper on two denominations and their positions on two issues. So it's not like we're going to take two, two denominations and we're going to take a look at two different issues. It's like uh, my example I wrote down here, Roman Catholics and Southern Baptists. So two denominations, not just Baptists, Southern Baptists. Uh, there's a convention of them cleverly called the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, which has a whole issue dealing with politics as well. But Roman Catholics and Southern Baptists on gambling and undocumented workers open borders. So what's the Catholic Church on undocumented workers? What's the Southern Baptist? So that just infuriates them. But I don't, I don't know what they know about that. It's like, well, research it. Ask Google. Uh, a little bit of story time. Hopefully I have time for story time. A little bit of story time. And I'm sure I'm using the wrong word here, deprecate over time. I've had students who write beautifully at the beginning of the semester. There's periods. There's verb noun agreement or noun verb agreement. There's adjectives. About halfway through the semester, all of a sudden, the writing has gone down dramatically. I mean, what might have taken, what really should have taken three sentences to answer my question, now is answered in one word, uh, which is misspelled, on a computer. How do you misspell on a computer? Uh, 
And so uh, I always end up asking, because I'm concerned, uh, like any, any professor might be, you know, is this student, did this student hit some new hard drugs or something somewhere? Uh, or maybe they need some medical, you know, mental health things. What I usually get back is, I broke up with my girlfriend boyfriend. The moral of the story here is, we didn't need chatbots back in the early OOs, whatever we call the first part of the century. We had boyfriends and girlfriends to do our classes for us. Uh, sometimes I have a husband and a wife in a class. The most unprofessional thing I do, well, it's not the most, there's a lot of other unprofessional things I do. But one of the really unprofessional things I do in an online class is, if I get two papers that look identical, I give one a good grade and I give another one a really bad grade. And eventually the one who got the really bad grade will come back with, well, I wrote my paper just like Jimmy did. And I'm sitting there going, aha. Uh, so not only that, then I can take Jimmy's off too because Jimmy allowed himself to be copied by you know, Sally or whatever. So uh, uh, am I encouraging anyone to take any of my online classes now? <laughs> the things I do sitting in my online, online classes. Uh, now think about the I told you so. I sometimes wonder, is it really my job to adequately prepare them, the students for the future? Or is it not the student's job to adequately prepare themselves for the future? I had a professor, I used to dislike him a lot. Now I send him like Christmas cards every, actually sometimes every week just to remind him. Uh, but uh, he used to always ask, am I my student's keeper? You can lead students to knowledge, but may you make them think. So my job is to just give you the stuff. It's not how you use it is up to you. Uh, so when you get that first job and they want you to do something that you should have learned how to do in my class, and you come back and say, well, I need to teach me. It's like, here it is. Here's proof you did it. Not very well, but <laughs> uh, that's the other great thing about online. It captures all the writing. You don't have to have it slipped under your door or, or whatever. So what do I do now? Uh, I was trained to teach it when I was teaching online. And I've taken all sorts of online, how to teach online classes. They're usually taught online. Uh, no, actually, one a couple years ago, I actually had to go somewhere for that. I, I went to Madison, Wisconsin, uh, and that was kind of fun. All the cheese curds you can eat. But uh, one of the things you're supposed to do is keep the students connected to the course. How do you do that? Well, regular assignments, weekly assignments. I usually have mine weekly. I have them at a most, turn them in at the worst possible time, Wednesdays at noon. You would think the world ends Wednesday at 1130. Oh, Dr. Roush, I'm at work. I can't turn it in at noon. It's like, hmm, how's Tuesday at 10? You can turn it in then. It'll still be sitting there at noon. It doesn't disappear when it changes to Wednesday. Uh, authentic assignments. Now, that's a little bit more challenging. What sort of authentic assignments? OK, you've essentially destroyed Texas, create a new government. It's got to be better. No, uh, Freudian, sorry. Uh, one of the things that I, I didn't, and this is just my personal comment here, and I guess I will just gloss right over it, but it would be very helpful, would be helped. Uh, students are like, more likely to cheat in core classes than they are in their upper level, usually. So in their major classes. But what you usually hear during like advising, and I do a lot of new student orientation in the summer advising, you always hear those advisors says, well, you just gotta get past your basics and you get your real classes. It's like, I'm sitting there going, okay. My mom said, don't swear when you're with a lot of people. But I want to go over there now and swear at that person for calling them just a basic. Uh, for me, government is probably the most important class you could ever take. Because why are you going to complain about it if you don't know what you're complaining about? Uh, so I always tell my students that. Uh, sometimes a little bit louder, they turn their volume down on their computer. Because uh, we're also supposed to do more videos now. Uh, I just thought that was sort of interesting. So many assignments have a lot more assignments, I've reduced the value of testing. I tried for a while online proctoring. Students absolutely detest online proctoring. I had a student one time tell me she couldn't take the test because her parents were sleeping in her living room. And it took me almost a better part of a week to ruminate on that. First of all, there's so many issues there. Why are her parents sleeping in her living room? Why are her parents sleeping? Why didn't she take them, you know, take the test before they were sleeping? Uh, I didn't even ask. Uh, one of my colleagues, I guess, knew the student pretty well and, and said, you don't want to ask. Uh, so I didn't. But uh, I sometimes listen to directions. So, 
Students don't like being watched while they're taking an exam. So I guess when you give an exam and the instructor is sitting up front watching while you're taking there, is that got to be uncomfortable too? Uh, typically for me, it's a oh hello. <laughs> Why am I sitting? Oh, that's right, it's a test. Uh, so uh, I tend to have smaller uh, submissions, but the problem is I will get on my evaluations. This is a lot of busy work. Uh, one of my favorite assignments, and I was hoping I wouldn't have to change it. Show of hands. This is the audience participation part. How many of you think that we elect all our judges? Here in the state of Texas, those of you who've taken political science 2306 or its equivalent, raise your hand if you think we elect all our judges. That question has so much depth in it. Uh, first of all, the Constitution says we do. We do elect all our judges. Reality says we don't. Uh, in fact, right now, if you were to look at the Texas Supreme Court, there are nine members on the Texas Supreme Court. One of them made it to the court by being elected. Eight of them were originally appointed by somebody, mostly Governor Perry because he was governor for 500 years. Uh, it was hard to tell if it was actually him or if there was like a stand-up cutout or something. But uh, isn't that important? So that's why I have the students go and look at each of the biographies. It does seem a little busy-ish. This one seems very busy-ish. What I need to do and I haven't done is go through and, and that little story I told you about the judges, do that for each of my assignments. The problem is I change my assignments every now and then and I'll forget to change the, the audio or whatever goes with them to explain them. But this, this one, what I want people to do is they keep a list of who, who, who's a lobbyist. Maybe your friend from church is a lobbyist. Heaven help them. Uh, Every year I have to update this one too because they have a new list every year too. That, that becomes a bit, bit of a challenge. One of the things you might be interested in knowing is this individual question is worth 10 points out of the semester total of 865. So am I going to spend a lot of time cheating on this for 10 out of 865? Just do it. Uh, it takes less time. My longer questions are really actually essay questions from exams. Uh, what's the relationship between public opinion and candidates and political parties? Uh, so I have two types of questions that go to find stuff on the web and write about it. Uh, early voting is my favorite. Uh, even when the Secretary of State took that data away, I called down and had her put it back on. Well, actually, it wasn't her. No, it wasn't her. We've gone through so many Secretaries of State that it's hard to keep track of their gender. Uh, What's funny about these questions, though, is I got a lot of students who submit references. I found this at, well, you didn't have to find it. It's in your textbook. Where do you think I got the question? I'm not the most energetic faculty member. Uh, I got the question out of the textbook. That's where you should probably find the answer. Odds are this is probably a subhead in my textbook, uh, just by the way that the textbook is written. So in summary. While doing uh, some thinking and looking around for stuff, I encountered the work of a professor named Ethan Mollick, which I'm probably mispronouncing, but uh, that's the way it looks to me. He is a professor at the Wharton School. That's one of them business colleges. Uh, you can tell because it's named after someone. <laughs> I really don't get out much. Uh, so uh, he actually, in his classes, requires students to use chatbots. Uh, he says, and I may not have written this down here, but he says that sometimes it's, it's a lot nicer to read the papers when they're done well. Uh, and really, it actually, it is. If you get someone who does a beautiful paper, I uh, had a student one time who wrote an excellent How a Bill Becomes a Law, so I asked her and I used it as an example. And then in the next semester, which was the fall semester, very key, it was a fall semester, she actually took that paper that I used as an example and turned it in as hers. There were several problems there. The spring semester, the legislature was still was meeting, so everything was in present tense. In the fall, the legislature had ended its session back in May, and her paper was still in present tense. And I'm sitting there going, no, no, the bill is no longer in that committee because A, that committee doesn't exist anymore, and B, you copied this paper from the one I put up as an example. Oh, some guy gave it to me. And I'm like, some guy? Well, do you know the guy's name? Well, I don't want to get him in trouble. It's like, ma'am? You're currently swinging on a very short rope. <laughs> Give him up. She didn't. Uh, what's cool, and I don't know if you can actually, if you go to the, 
Just look up Ethan Mollick. He has a practical guide to using AI to do stuff. And probably the most important part of the practical guide is he lists different reviews. Of, he's used a bunch of different chatbots, and he gives you know, pros and cons about why using them, why not using them. Uh, but he also talks about students. You have to be more prepared. You have to ask it good questions. Uh, when I was learning computer stuff as an undergraduate in 1985, uh, we learned this little term, garbage in, garbage out. Well, it's very appropriate here. You ask it a dumb question, it's going to give you a dumb answer. Dr. Roush is going to read that dumb answer and have a dumb comment, which unfortunately only his cats will hear, uh, unless I'm recording it. So uh, somebody didn't like my comments. Uh, uh, unless I copy something weird, I have all black print. Uh, but a friend of mine on Facebook, he's actually one of my former professors from when I was an undergraduate, uh, has been playing around with these things. And he found that it gives him useful information. They're useful, but standard, kind of like what everybody says. Uh, and he said it sounds just like a student. <laughs> uh, the citations are typically wrong. Uh, unreliable sources, just like many students do. And just uh, looking around, we were talking about bias. Are chatbots biased? Uh, this one, one reporter tried to get a chatbot to give him a poem about the positive qualities of former President Trump, uh, and it, it refused to even try. I don't know what that says about the chatbot. I applaud it. But, uh, but it did wax eloquent about President Biden, which I'm also finding some difficulties. There's a heart. He's from Delaware, uh, teeny little eastern state. What have I learned? Uh, I need more time. Uh, let's see, now I can write my paper about failed constitutional amendments. My, my mom is still asking, why the ones that failed? Why don't you do the ones that passed? It's like, everybody does the ones that passed. Someone's got to do the ones that failed. They feel inferior. Uh, so uh, uh, it is important, though, in the political field, I know that there are some campaigns that use chatbots to write like their campaign thingies, their campaign statements, campaign speeches and stuff. Uh, I know uh, uh, robocalls, now we have robocalls by chatbots. Uh, so that's one of the places where uh, if you're going to lose your job, it'll probably be the people who call people uh, with robocalls because now they're going to have computers do it, which is not a bad thing because it's easier to hang up on a computer. Although sometimes it's fun just to put them there and record them while they're, while they're talking. We don't know yet if, whatever I, when I do that, if I'm doing it legally or not. So I purposely try to do it in my office because I can say it's science. Uh, so if I do it at home, it's just entertainment. But uh, so uh, they let me keep teaching here. I always find that surprising too. 